Once upon a time, in the vast landscapes of southern Africa, there existed a remarkable kingdom known as the Zulu Kingdom, or as the locals called it, KwaZulu. It was a small yet formidable state, nestled in what is now South Africa. This kingdom would go on to etch its name in the annals of history during the Anglo-Zulu War, a conflict that brought them both fame and adversity. The Zulu's moment of glory came to the forefront during the Battle of Izandlawana in 1879 when, against all odds, they emerged victorious over the mighty British forces. This triumph, however, was short-lived, as the British eventually annexed Zululand in 1887. Despite this, the Zulu kingship endured, albeit with the colonial title of Paramount Chief. The Zulu people, renowned for their bravery and prowess in warfare, earned the respect even of the British, who often held prejudiced views against Africans. The Battle of Izandlawana left an indelible mark, inspiring generations in the anti-apartheid struggle in the racially divided South Africa, where the Zulu nation found itself designated as a Bantustan, or homeland. The roots of the Zulu civilization trace back to their migration during the broader Bantu expansion in southern Africa. Their kingdom became part of the tapestry of Bantu empires, coexisting with entities like the Great Zimbabwe Civilization. In the face of the scramble for Africa, a period where European powers carved up the continent for themselves, the Zulus stood tall, at least initially, resisting the encroachment on their land and sovereignty. The rise of the Zulu kingdom under the leadership of Shaka adds a fascinating chapter to their history. Shaka, the illegitimate son of Chief Senzangakona, faced exile alongside his mother Nandi. Their refuge with the Umtetwa set the stage for Shaka's journey as a warrior under the guidance of Dingizweo, leader of the Umtetwa Paramountcy. After Senzanga Kona's demise, Dingizweo played a crucial role in helping Shaka ascend to the position of chief of the Zulu kingdom. However, the story took a dark turn with the succession of Shaka's half-brother, Dingane. In a treacherous act, Dingane conspired with another half-brother, Amshangana, to murder Shaka. The throne tainted with blood, Dingane continued his ruthless quest for power by executing Amshangana and eliminating all royal kin. This brutal purge extended to past supporters of Shaka, securing Dingane's grip on the throne. Amidst this dark chapter, one half-brother, Mpand, managed to escape the purges, perceived as too weak to pose a threat at the time. As the Zulu kingdom navigated the turbulent currents of history, New chapters unfolded with clashes against the Fortrekkers and the eventual ascendancy of Mpand. In the autumn of 1837, Pete Retief, a leader among the Fortrekkers, ventured to Dingane's royal crawl to negotiate a land deal. The stage was set for a pivotal moment in Zulu history. Dingane, seeking the return of cattle allegedly stolen by a local chief, tasked Retief and his party with a mission. In February 1838, after successfully recovering the cattle, a treaty was signed. Dingane agreed to cede all the land south of the Tagela River to the Mzimvubu River to the Fortrekkers. Joyous celebrations ensued, marking a supposed accord between the two groups. However, the veneer of peace shattered on February 6, 1838. During a dance held in honor of the agreement, Dingane seized the opportunity to betray Retief and his men. As the dance reached its zenith, Dingane cried out, Bambani Abathakati, a call to seize the wizards. Retief and his party were overpowered, taken to a nearby hill called Kwamadi Wayne, and ruthlessly executed. Some believe the killings were spurred by the Fortrekkers withholding some of the recovered cattle, while others saw it as a calculated move by Dingane to overpower his guests. Following this treacherous act, Dingane's forces descended upon a Fortrekker camp near Wayanan, resulting in the massacre of 500 men, women, and children, a haunting event that etched the name, Wanan, meaning to weep, onto the land. In the wake of these tragedies, the remaining Fortrekkers rallied under a new leader, Andres Praetorius. A decisive battle unfolded at Blood River on December 16, 1838, where Praetorius led a group of 470 settlers against Dingane's forces, inflicting a crushing defeat upon the Zulu king. Dingane, in the aftermath, burned his royal household and fled north, leaving chaos in his wake. Mpand, the half-brother spared from Dingane's purges, seized the opportunity. Joining forces with Praetorius and the Fortrekkers, Mpanda waged war against Dingane. The final blow came near the modern Swaziland border, where Dingane met his demise at the hands of assassins. Mpand emerged as the new ruler of the Zulu nation. 
The aftermath of Dingani's defeat saw the formation of the Boer Republic of Natalia in 1839 under Pretorius's leadership. Mpan, maintaining peaceful relations, witnessed the region's transformation. However, the tides of conflict turned in 1842 when war erupted between the British and the Boers, leading to the annexation of Natalia by the British. In the midst of these changes, Mpan shifted his allegiance to the British, fostering good relations with them. In 1843, however, Mpant initiated a purge within his kingdom, resulting in deaths and mass migration of refugees into neighboring areas, including British-controlled Natal. This turbulent period saw Mpant raiding surrounding territories, even venturing into Swaziland in 1852. British pressure forced a withdrawal, but Mpant's influence persisted. Amidst these challenges, a power struggle for succession unfurled between Mpant's sons, Setshweo and Ambuyazi. The clash reached its climax in 1856, with Mbuyazi meeting his demise. Setshweo, undeterred, began asserting his authority. In 1872, Mpanda passed away, and Setshweo ascended to the throne. The years that followed brought a border dispute between the Boers and the Zulus in the Transvaal. With the region now under British rule, they adjudicated between the two parties. A commission favored the Zulu claim but the British governor added a clause demanding compensation to the Boers for resettlement, marking another complex turn in the Zulu Kingdom's tumultuous journey. As the past battles lingered, a dark cloud descended upon the Zulu Kingdom with the onset of the Anglo-Zulu War. A series of incidents, each serving as a pretext for British moral outrage, unfolded, further intensifying the tensions between the two nations. One such incident involved the fleeing wife of a Zulu chief seeking refuge in British territory, only to meet a tragic end at the hands of the British. Seizing this as a breach of their own laws, the British, on December 10, 1878, sent an ultimatum to Setshweo, the Zulu king, demanding the disbandment of his army. When the defiant king refused, British forces crossed the Tukela River at the end of December 1878, setting the stage for the war that would unfold in 1879. In the early stages of the conflict, the Zulus achieved a notable victory at the Battle of Izandlawana on January 22, but the tides turned later that day at Rourke's Drift, where they suffered a severe defeat. The war ultimately concluded with the Zulus facing defeat at the Battle of Ulundi on July 4. Despite the Zulu defeat, their warriors earned a profound respect from the British. In the intricate dance of power in Africa, the British depended not only on military strength but also on the perception of an unstoppable force. The defeat at Izandlawana compelled the British to mobilize their might to overcome Setshweo, even though at the time the empire held no significant interest in that part of Africa. In the aftermath of the war, Setshweo, once a formidable leader, was captured a month after his defeat and exiled to Cape Town. The British, in an attempt to control the Zulu kingdom, divided it among 13 kinglets, each ruling over a sub-kingdom. Predictably, conflicts erupted among these sub-kingdoms, adding another layer of turmoil to the beleaguered land. In a surprising turn of events in 1882, Setshweo was allowed to visit England. He had audiences with Queen Victoria and other dignitaries before being permitted to return to Zululand and reclaim his throne. However, the fragile peace was shattered in 1883 when Zibebu, one of the appointed kinglets supported by Boer mercenaries, attacked Setshweo at Yulundi. The wounded Setshweo fled, and in February 1884, he succumbed, possibly to poisoning. With Setshweo's demise, the mantle passed to his 15-year-old son, Dinazulu. The Zulu kingdom, once proud and unified, now found itself at a crossroads, grappling with division, betrayal, and the ominous shadows of a shifting destiny. As the Zulu kingdom continued its tumultuous journey through the pages of history, the tale took an unexpected turn with the emergence of Dina Zulu, son of the late Setshweo. In a bid to regain control and assert his authority, Dina Zulu sought the assistance of Boer mercenaries led by the formidable Louis Bota. These hired warriors, known as Dina Zulu's volunteers, proved their mettle by defeating Zibebu in 1884. In a pact sealed by the echoes of battle, Dina Zulu promised these mercenaries land in return for their loyalty. The victorious volunteers, having fulfilled their part of the bargain, demanded their reward. In 1884, they were granted approximately half of Zululand, each receiving individual plots as farms. United under this newfound land, they formed an independent republic that sent ripples of concern through the British Empire. Alarmed by this development, the British swiftly annexed Zululand in 1887, 
shattering the dreams of independence harbored by Dina Zulu and his volunteers. The Zulu king found himself entangled in subsequent conflicts with rival factions, further complicating the fate of his kingdom. In 1906, Dina Zulu faced accusations of orchestrating the Bambatha Rebellion, a charge that led to his arrest and trial by the British on charges of high treason and public violence. In the aftermath of the trial, Dina Zulu's destiny took a twist. In 1909, he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment on St. Helena Island. His ally Louis Bota, who had led the volunteers to victory, later became the first Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa. Displaying a sense of loyalty, Bota arranged for Dina Zulu to live in exile on a farm in the Transvaal, where the once mighty Zulu king breathed his last in 1913. The reins of Zulu leadership, however, were not entirely relinquished. Dina Zulu's son, Solomon Ka Dina Zulu, struggled to reclaim the royal legacy but faced resistance from South African authorities who recognized him only as a local chief. Despite official titles, Solomon garnered support among chiefs, political intellectuals like John Longalibalele Dubé, and the ordinary Zulu populace. In 1923, Solomon initiated the organization Nkata Yilkwa Zulu to champion his royal claims. Although the organization experienced periods of dormancy, it resurfaced in the 1970s under the leadership of Mangasuthu Budalezi, chief minister of the KwaZulu Bantustan. The recognition of Solomon's son, Cyprian Bekuzulu Ka Solomon, as the paramount chief of the Zulu people in December 1951, carried limited power. White South African officials retained control over ordinary Zulu people through local chiefs, emphasizing the disparity between titles and real authority. The era of apartheid brought forth the creation of the KwaZulu homeland in 1950. From 1970 onward, all Bantu people were considered citizens of KwaZulu, not South Africa, losing their passports in the process. This distinction was abolished in 1994, and KwaZulu is now part of the province of KwaZulu Natal. Throughout the struggles against oppression, the Zulu people held on to the pride of their early resistance to white domination. Shaka remained a national hero, his story enacted in numerous dramas that fueled the spirit of the anti-apartheid struggle. In 2004, thousands of Zulus participated in a reenactment of the Battle of Izandlawana, marking its 125th anniversary, an event that resonated with the enduring pride and resilience of a people shaped by their remarkable history.